Hello everyone, this is Dennis and you are on the Den Electro channel. Today we will assemble a half bridge auto generator power supply with a power of 240 watts. The internet is full of varieties of circuits for this power supply. Of these, I found the best one, changed something in it, and today I'll tell you about it in detail. Despite its power, the power supply circuit is very simple. Many parts can be obtained from old equipment. The most important part here is the transformer. It is built on a horizontal scan transformer from a Soviet TV. Now I will show the circuit, show how the power supply is assembled. Test it, talk about a simple method for calculating a transformer for similar circuits. And talk about the nuances that may occur when assembling this power supply. The power supply circuit looks like this. On the left is an alternating mains voltage of 220 volts, and on the right at the output we get a constant voltage of 42 volts. There are two transformers here, power T1 and control T2. In transformer T1, the primary winding is divided into two half windings, each with 27 turns. The secondary winding W2 also consists of two semi-windings, each with 15 turns. The entire winding is tapped from the middle. Another secondary winding W3 has six turns. From it, voltage also goes to W3, but this is already the primary winding of transformer T2. Transformer T2 has a primary winding of 21 turns. Both secondary windings W1 and W2 consist of 7 turns. Please note that transformer T2 has windings W1 and W2 connected in antiphase. Each winding is connected to the base of the transistor through a resistor. The transistors open in turn, each at its own half cycle. The trigger circuit is based on elements R8, C9 and DIAC1. After voltage is applied to the power supply, capacitor C9 begins to charge through resistor R8. When the voltage on the capacitor reaches the desired limit, the DB3 dinister opens through it. Capacitor C9 is immediately discharged to the base of transistor Q2. The transistor opens briefly allowing current to flow to the primary winding T1. As a result, Voltage appears on the secondary winding W3, which is supplied to transformer T2. Transistor Q1 then opens, directing current to the other one as it appears. Thus, generation is started in the power supply, which will feed itself. The parts in the power supply do not have to be exactly the same as I indicated. The resistance of resistors and the capacitance of capacitors can be changed up or down with a deviation of 10 to 15 percent. Transistors 13009 can be replaced with 13007. If you assemble a power supply of less power, then you can use 13005 or even 13003. With a power of 100 watts, capacitors C4 and C5 can be taken at 0.5 microfarads. If the power is even less, then the capacity can be reduced to 100 nanofarads. Resistor R5 at 91 ohms must be at least 2 watts. For my power supply I will make a board using laser cardboard technology. To do this, I take thick cardboard, on one side I glue paper with tracks connecting all the parts, and on the top side there will be a designation of all the elements. Of course, you don't have to make this thicker, but I like it better this way. This is where the high voltage side is located, a transformer will be installed in the middle, and this is the low voltage side. This is the first version of the board layout. In the second version I will fix some things. Then you need to make holes in the board with a thick needle. Then you can insert all the components, bend the legs and solder them together. 
For the transformer of my power supply I will use a horizontal scan transformer extracted from a Soviet TV. There are many windings on it that are almost impossible to unwind. Therefore, it is easier to cut the entire coil. Sometimes it pulls out almost without problems and the core turns out clean and neat. In other cases, it turns out like this. The glue remains on the core and even with a knife it is very difficult to remove. Sometimes the transformers installed in TVs are slightly damaged. This reduces the cross-section of the magnetic circuit slightly, but this did not affect the quality of the picture on the TV. To disassemble the magnetic circuit, you need to unscrew the nuts. Then the aluminum plate is removed. By the way, there is usually a sticker on it with the transformer marking written on it. The core consists of two U-shaped halves, fastened with a staple. If during disassembly the ferrite breaks into at least 10 pieces, it's not a problem, it can always be glued together. Unfortunately, this core does not have a frame for winding wire, so you will have to make it yourself. To create it you will need a 16mm bolt and exactly the same nut. The inner cylinder is glued together from two halves of thread spools. They need to be cut, then stretched a little so that they do not curl back into a tube and installed on the bolt. Then you need to go over the seams with a hot soldering iron so that the halves are fused together. Then I make circles out of cardboard, put them on the cylinder and glue them too. Then the structure is tightened with a nut and left for a day so that everything dries and hardens. First I wind half of the primary winding. I make a hole in the bottom wall of the frame with a thick needle. I insert the wire there and turn it to the left. Then the wire will come out from the right side and I wind all the turns in the same direction. There will be 27 turns here. The wire comes out through the top wall. I used wire about 0.4 millimeters in diameter. The result was one layer of winding that occupied almost the entire width of the frame. Then you need to make insulation. I'll wrap three layers of mylar tape. If there is nothing like that, then you can use ordinary tape, wrapping a bunch of layers, or electrical tape. Next comes the transistor control winding. For it I will use a double wire with a diameter of 0.2 millimeters. Just like before, I insert the wire from below, bend it to the left, put it behind the frame and it comes out on the right. I make six turns in this direction. I bring the end up. Due to the fact that the wire has a certain thickness, and its winding did not take up the entire space of the frame, a small level difference appeared on the cylinder. Consequently, the next winding will lie unevenly. Therefore, you need to wrap a couple of layers of electrical tape in the empty spaces to smooth out all the unevenness. Then I insulate again. We did all these procedures as if on the high voltage side. Then you need to turn the core over and switch to working on the low voltage side. This is where the secondary winding is wound. I take a triple wire with a diameter of approximately 0.6 millimeters and pass it through the bottom wall. Just like the previous windings, I bend it to the left. I do 15 turns. The first half winding ended in the middle of the frame. From this place you need to lift the ends up. Then the insulation is done again. Please note that the winding level is uneven. Next I make the second half of the secondary winding. I insert three wires from above and bend them to the left. I also wind 15 turns in the same direction as the previous half. I use the wire to occupy the space that remains from the previous half. Here, too, the winding turned out to be two layers. It ended approximately in the middle, from this place I bend the ends and bring them down. 
Then I wind the electrical tape again to level the level for the next winding. Before this, you can secure the winding with a little tape so that it does not unwind while you glue the tape. Still, the reins are triple, thick and hard. Then we again make two or three layers of insulation and turn the frame over to the other side. At the top, near the end where we finished winding half of the primary winding, we insert another wire and wrap it to the left. This will be the second half of the primary winding, all turns wind in the same direction. There are also 27 turns here. When the wire comes out on the right side, push it down. When all the windings are ready on the outside, insulation can be made. Then the bolt must be pulled out of the frame and the core must be inserted there. An iron bracket is put on the core, pushed into the frame. A plate is put on the other side and tightened with a nut. If you look at the transformer from above, the high voltage side will be on the left. These are the ends of both halves of the primary winding, and this is their connection. The right side of the transformer is low voltage. Here the two ends of both halves of the secondary winding come out, and their connection is on top. After installing the transformer on the board, I bent the ends of the secondary winding and pushed them into the holes. The gray hair outlet was made from three wires twisted together. It is pushed into the board and soldered to the transformer. In this way, the ends of the windings are inserted on the high voltage side. The first two ends are the primary winding, and the third, which is two wire, is the transistor control winding. The second terminal of this winding is also inserted into the board. Transformer T2 swings on this small ring. You can see its dimensions on your screens. It can be taken from the ballast of an energy-saving fluorescent light bulb. There are three windings on it that need to be removed. On the transformer, you first need to make 21 turns, this will be the primary winding. Be sure to pay attention to the placement of the wires, how they enter and exit the core. Then you need to make two secondary windings, each with seven turns. Here you also need to pay attention to the direction of winding. It should look like this. Start and end of W1, start and end of W2 and start and end of W3. The diameter of all wires is approximately 0.1 mm. The core is installed on the board like this. The secondary windings will be on the left and the primary on the right. This power supply is very noisy so that this high-frequency interference does not enter the network. There are two X-type capacitors at the input. A common mode choke is installed between the capacitors, and together they form a noise suppression filter that prevents electromagnetic interference from entering the power supply into the network and vice versa from the network into the power supply. Alternating current 220 volts passes through it freely and the high-frequency current is attenuated. The diode bridge is assembled from 81N4007 diodes. Each arm contains two diodes. In this way, the current is divided and greater throughput will be achieved. Such a diode bridge will withstand 2 amperes, but it is advisable to take a larger supply. If you have a powerful diode bridge, then you can install it. But you will have to change the board layout. I installed diodes only because they are easier for an ordinary radio amateur to find. They are found in almost any electronics. You can put one diode in a diode bridge, but then I don't recommend raising the power of the power supply to more than 100 watts. 
Transistor Q1 and Q2, I installed 13,009, although you can use 13,007. Diodes D8 and D9 are 20100CT Schottky diodes. Their voltage reserve is not very large. Here it is better to use 200 volts. You can also use Soviet 2D213 diodes. To cool the transistors I will use these aluminum radiators, taken from an old Soviet tape recorder. These radiators are enough for a 100W power supply without additional airflow. For the diode assembly I use a slightly larger radiator. I will use Soviet capacitors C4 and C5, for one microfarad of 250 volts. Capacitor C9 is wide type, set to 4.7 nanofarads. For maximum suppression of interference from the primary winding to the secondary. For the output choke L2 I will use this ring with a white stripe. I took it from a computer power supply. I removed all the windings from it. But I used two wires from there. These wires, about 1 mm in diameter, need to be made from 12 to 15 turns. Distributing them evenly throughout the ring. You will need to make one jumper on the board between points, JJ. You can take the wire shorter and then carefully place it somewhere. The first switching on of the power supply must be done through the safety light. It should blink and go out. After this, the signal LED on the power supply lights up, and voltage appears on the voltmeter. True, it is unstable and jumps all the time. But if you take one of the secondary winding terminals with your hand, the voltage will show adequately. This is due to the fact that the ripples coming from the secondary winding of the transformer are not completely smoothed out by the filter. Therefore, the multimeter begins to fail. If everything is fine and the power supply is working, then the light bulb can be turned off. Be careful when connecting the power supply to the network. The capacitor at the input has a very large capacitance and therefore there will not be much fireworks when power is applied. Now the voltmeter shows more because there was a slight voltage drop across the bulb. To conveniently monitor the voltage, I will use a dial multimeter. He swallows the pulsations and shows the tension more believably. To load the power supply I put together this thing. This is an ordinary cardboard box. On top there is a hole sealed with tape. Inside there is a heating element taken from an old heater. It has nichrome wire wound in it. There are many wires connected to it. By combining different wires you can adjust the power. The fan from the processor blows air over this whole thing. To test the full power, it is necessary to supply airflow to the transistors. Without a connected load at idle, the power supply shows a voltage of 42 volts. After connecting the load, the current became slightly more than 3 amperes, and the voltage dropped to approximately 39 volts. Then I increased the power, current is 5 amperes, voltage is 38 volts. I'll add one more thing and it turns out to be 34 volts 7 amperes. The power consumption of the load is approximately 238 watts. You can squeeze more power out of this power supply, but naturally the voltage will drop. 
It is not recommended to drop the voltage below 25%. As a result, the power supply may turn off. If the power supply shuts down due to overload, 9 out of 10 times nothing will happen. The 10th time the power transistors may burn out. Here I have connected 3 incandescent lamps in series. The power of each light bulb is 40 watts. The supply voltage is 12 volts. The current is approximately more than 3 amperes. I plug it in and see what happens. The light went out. The voltage dropped to zero, the power supply died. If you disconnect the load, the power supply starts again. The thing is that the cold spirals of light bulbs have very little resistance. When they are connected, a short circuit occurs. It turns out that the power supply has protection against short circuits, but it does not always work. 20 times in a row the power supply can go into protection and the 21st time the transistors burn out. Now I'll tell you how to calculate a transformer for this type of power supply. I found this method on the internet, it is very simplified and is not even remotely similar to the calculations used for pulse transformers. Nevertheless, it works and I think it will be useful to many. To make such a switching power supply, you can use almost any magnetic conductor. I showed this transformer at the beginning, and for my power supply I used this core. They look almost similar, the cross-sectional area of the magnetic core is the same, but the length of the magnetic core is different. You can also use ferrite rings here, preferably with a permeability of about 2000. With small cores, naturally the power supply will produce less power, but it will be compact and will work exactly the same. Such cores with a gap in the middle cannot be used. And of course, the cores can be used not only from Soviet TV's transformers, but also from foreign TDKS. The magnetic circuits here are slightly smaller than their Soviet counterparts, but it will also work. Please note that some ferrites from TV's transformers have magnetic permeability written on them, while others do not. But it doesn't matter, if you enter the transformer markings on the internet, you can find the brand of ferrite there. Now let's move on to the calculations. For example, I will use the same core as in my power supply. The calculation method that I will now discuss is used for ferrite with a permeability of 2000. Although during the testing process I didn't notice the difference between 2 and 3000. Just for this power supply I use a ferrite core with a magnetic permeability of 3000. To calculate the required number of turns in each winding, you need to know the cross-sectional area of the core. The area of a circle is calculated using this formula. We multiply pi by the squared diameter and divide the resulting product by 4. This core has a post diameter of 15.8 millimeters. Converting this figure to centimeters, it turns out 1.58. If you substitute the numbers into the formula, you get the following expression. First, we multiply 1.58 by 1.58 and then multiply the resulting amount by 3.14. Then we divide everything by 4 and get the cross-sectional area of the core. In this example it is 1.95 cm squared. To find out how many turns you need to wind per 1 volt, we will use the following form. Let's take a constant coefficient of 0.7 and divide it by the core area. The resulting figure was 0.358. This means that in order to get 1 volt on the core you need to make 0.3 turns. Now you can start calculating the turns in all windings. The number of turns is calculated from the winding voltage. 
The peculiarity of the half-bridge circuit is that the rectified mains voltage does not reach the primary winding in full, but is divided in half. After the input capacitor, the rectified amplitude voltage value will be approximately 310 volts. If you consider that the voltage sometimes sags, then you can take 300 volts. The primary winding will receive half of this voltage 150 volts. So we multiply 150 by 0 0.358 and we get 54 turns. It is always better to round up. Then we calculate the number of turns in the secondary winding. We take the required voltage, in my case it is 42 volts and multiply by 0 0.358. It turns out 15 turns. Just don't forget that our secondary winding consists of two half windings, each of which operates on its own half cycle. It turns out that you need to wind two windings of 15 turns each. The winding that controls the bases of the transistors must be calculated so that it produces 16 volts. Here we do everything in the same way using the method described above and get 6 turns. And now I'll tell you about a small amenity that can occur during the exploitation process. It consists in heating the transformer. Even without a load in standby mode, the transformer begins to heat up. I put a temperature sensor on the core. After half an hour of operation in idle mode, the magnetic circuit heated up to 50 degrees. Then the temperature also rises, but not so quickly. After another half hour, the temperature became 54 degrees. The temperature no longer rises above this indicator. My guess is this. The horizontal scan transformer in the TV operated at a frequency of 15 kHz. And the frequency of this power supply is from 20 to 30 kilohertz. Most likely, the ferrite in this magnetic core is simply not designed to operate at such high frequencies. Because of this, it begins to warm up. If you have any assumptions of your own, I would be interested to know them, write about it in the comments. Let me clarify that only the cores taken from horizontal scan transformers heat up. Transformers that are designed for high purity, for example in computer power supplies, will not heat up. They remain cold during operation. Now I'll tell you about the nuances associated with the selection of parts. A situation may arise that one of the transistors will heat up more. The thing is that the circuit of this power supply is self-oscillating. Therefore, the length of the pulse in each half period will depend on the characteristics of the parts. It is very important to select two transistors with the same characteristics. It is advisable to take them from the same series. The same applies to the resistors installed in the bases of these transistors. For transistors, you need to check the voltage drop across the PN junctions and, if possible, check the gain. The difference in resistance between resistors R3 and R4 should not exceed 0.2 ohms. You can also check the voltage at each half cycle of the secondary winding. To do this, you need to turn off one of the diodes and then check the output voltage. Then connect the diode back and disconnect the second diode. And again measure the voltage. If the voltage at both half cycles is the same, this means everything is fine. If the voltage differs by at least half a volt, then there is a discrepancy in the details. If you wish, you can assemble a small circuit like this to check the voltage. Instead of these parts, you can put any others, the main thing is that the diode is high frequency. The circuit is a conventional half-wave rectifier. An alternating voltage is supplied on the right, and a voltmeter is connected to the direct current on the left. The method for checking the voltage of both half cycles is as follows. The voltmeter is connected with one wire to the minus of the power supply. 
The minus is the middle point of the output of the secondary winding. The other wire of the voltmeter is connected to those terminals of the secondary winding that are connected to the diode assembly. It can be seen that the half period of this half winding shows a voltage of 42 volts. On the other winding the voltage is exactly the same. If the voltage is different, then the transistor that produces the higher voltage will heat up more. Now let's measure the voltage on the control winding of the transistor basis. When connecting the probes, you need to be very careful not to short circuit anything. In the first half cycle the voltage shows 16 volts. I swap the probes and sit on the same ends again. In the second half cycle of this winding, the voltage is also 16 volts. As you can see, the voltage matches very precisely, this is very good. In the description of the video I will leave a link to the printed circuit board file for this power supply, which opens in the Sprint Layout program. When you open the downloaded file, this picture will appear in front of you. This is a top view of the board. We see the tracks connecting all the elements as if through the board, they are on the other side. All details are marked in red. You can enter each of them with two clicks and see its denominations. Then you need to click File and Print. A window will appear. There are many squares in the upper left corner. One of them is signed, Shish1. We put a tick in it. Now only the top board image will be displayed. After this, click the Print button in the right corner. Then go back to the print menu. Check the F2 box to display only the board tracks and check the mirror checkbox so that the tracks are reflected. Then print it again. We cut out both drawings along the frame and glue them to cardboard on both sides. And one last piece of advice. If you have wound the transformers correctly, assembled the power supply according to the diagram, but it still does not work, then most likely you have messed up the phasing of the winding connections. The problem lies in this location. This is the connection of windings W3 to W3. In order for the power supply to start and generation to begin, the ends must be swapped. Although I said that the power supply has some ripple at the output, this does not affect the operation of many devices. It can be used to assemble laboratory power supplies, assemble chargers, or power audio amplifiers. That's all for today. Like this video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Leave a comment to let me know you found the video helpful and bye everyone.